in the spirit of sharing knowledge, I think something probably many of us in this room know uh, is we're going through a very, very large transition right now in the market. We're pretty universally moving from a world of private data center, VMware, kind of traditional point and click administration to how do we start to embrace public clouds, whether it's AWS, Azure, GCP, all of the above. There's this sort of transition taking place in the market as we try and both change where we're landing, right, moving from kind of our private data centers into the cloud, but change the process by which we think about infrastructure, provision it, and move to more of an agile self-service sort of DevOps model. So in our view, this changes a lot of things. As we go through this transition, it's not just a shift of one or two tools. It's not just a slight tweak of our process. Our view is this is a pretty large change in the way we think about delivering applications, and it impacts many different groups. It impacts sort of the way our operations teams think about provisioning infrastructure. It impacts the way our security teams think about securing our applications, our data, our underlying infrastructure. It changes the way we deploy our applications, how we package it, how we think about CI, CD, what are the runtime environments we use for it. And lastly, it changes the way we think about networking, both at sort of the physical level as well as the application level. And in our view, there is sort of a broader kind of meta theme, right? It's this meta theme around a transition from a world that was much, much more static to a world that's much, much more dynamic and ephemeral and elastic. And as we undergo this change, it starts to break a lot of things, right? And so whether we're talking in infrastructure, where we used to have dedicated servers that were relatively you know, homogenous, to now it's very heterogeneous. We're running across multiple environments, and these things are coming and going all the time. It's not we're provisioning the VM and letting it live for months or years. It's we're provisioning the container and letting it live for hours or days. So a very different scale of infrastructure, a very different elasticity of infrastructure. And so how do we change how we think about infrastructure? We can't just be the same point and click approach as we try and do it you know, at orders of magnitude more scale and orders of magnitude faster. As we think about the shift in security, we're moving from a world where we largely depended on sort of the four walls wrapping our infrastructure. We had a notion of the network perimeter, uh, and we pinned things on IPs. IPs gave us a sense of identity, right? We knew this IP is the web server for at least the next few years. Uh, to a world where we don't really have four walls. We're kind of an API call away at any time from any node serving or receiving public facing traffic. And at the same time, the IP is just this recyclable unit, right? The VM dies, a new VM comes up, gets the same IP, containers are recycling it all the time. So how do we think about the change in security as we move to kind of this perimeter free, low trust model uh, and lose the identity we had in an IP level? So there's a lot of challenges there. As we think about our development tier, we are going from maybe a handful of relatively monolithic frameworks, right? Maybe our giant, you know, Spring framework and our C Sharp framework, to now we want to support many, many new ones, right? There's sort of a, a Cambrian explosion of interesting tools that have come out over the last few years. So whether it's our container platform, our Spark Big Data platform, you know, event-driven Lambda architectures, there's a huge variety of new platforms we want to explore and leverage uh, and make our developers sort of have a tool chain so that as their application is more event oriented, they can use that. Or if it's more you know, big data oriented, they can use something like Spark and provide all of these as part of the toolkit. And then lastly, there's the changes in networking land, which is as we're making this shift, as we're shifting from this dedicated, relatively stable infrastructure where we had the notion of an IP to now this very dynamic ephemeral infrastructure, how do we change our networking to keep up as well? We don't want to think in terms of IPs and manually updating our load balancers. Instead, we want to think in terms of fine-grained services, which might be a container, might be a Lambda function, you know, might be a VM. Uh, but these things are coming and going and scaling up and down. So in our view, this dynamic change is sort of the underpinning theme to all of these transitions. And what you'll see is this has been our focus for a long time from a toolchain perspective, is how do we lean into this change and build a toolchain that was designed for it, right? Thinking about cloud as sort of our, our native operating environment and really focusing on what should that experience be as we're moving to this world where we want infrastructure as code, we want microservices, we want cloud-oriented infrastructure. And so today I want to spend a little bit more time talking about what's happening in networking land and starting with really breaking down the monolith and what changes as we start to do so. So when we talk about the monolith, what we usually mean is 
sort of a single application that has many discrete subcomponents to it. Right? So an example I like to use is suppose we're delivering a desktop banking application. It might have multiple subcomponents. A might be you know, login, B might be view balance, C might be transfers, D might be foreign currency. So these are four discrete types of capability, different pages the user's interfacing with, different APIs, things like that. But we're delivering it as a single packaged application, a single monolithic server. And so what's nice in this format is when these systems need to interact with each other, if system A needs to call system B, it's easy. We just mark you know, a method in B as being public. We export it, and now A can just do an in-memory function call. No data is leaving the machine. We're just doing a quick you know, function hop over and then jumping back to A. So there's a lot of nice properties about how we compose these systems together. But what about things that run outside of the monolith? Because not everything is going to be within the app. And what we find is most of the things are really databases, right? We have our, our, most of our logic encapsulated within the application, and we're tr just talking to databases by and large through static IPs, right, when we talk about monolithic apps. As we need to start scaling up these applications, what we typically did was not break out the subpieces because we can't. They're being delivered as a single application. So instead, we deliver more copies of the monolith and then split our traffic over multiple instances using a load balancer approach. And then to secure the overall system, we split up into kind of three logical zones. Zone one, we don't trust at all, is our demilitarized zone, traffic coming in from the internet. Then kind of the middle tier zone, the application zone, where the monolith runs itself. And finally, our sort of database data zone, uh, which is sort of shielded from everything except for the applications. So what changed? Why do we need to do anything different? What's happened in the meantime? I think the first big thing is we've stopped writing monolithic applications. Right? Instead, over the last few years, there's been a shift away into microservice or service-oriented architectures, where kind of the core crux of it is how do we move away from packaging and delivering all of these subsystems as a single deliverable and deliver them as discrete logical services? The advantage of this is now if there's a bug in, let's say, our login portal, we don't now have to wait for you know, B, C, and D to all be in shape to be able to cut a release and deliver the monolith as one unit. If there's a bug in A, we can patch A and just redeploy A without having to wait for development teams B, C, and D to be ready and you know, have a build that compiles and redo all of the QA. So it gives us a lot more development agility. We're able to deliver these different discrete capabilities at whatever cadence makes sense, whether it's feature delivery, whether it's bug fixes, whether we're scaling up and down these individual pieces. We gain a lot more flexibility because we're not tightly coupling all of these different functions together. Unfortunately, like most things in life, uh, there's no free lunch. So what we are gaining uh, with developer efficiency of being able to do you know, and run A as a separate service we're starting to lose in terms of operational efficiency. There's new challenges that we inherit as a result. The first one, the one that becomes you know, obvious the fastest, is how do we do discovery? Right? Historically, what we used to do is just say, mark this as a public function. A can call it, and now it's just an in-memory function hop. Well, now it's not just mark it as a public service because it's not compiled into our application. It's not part of the app. It's not even running on the same machine. It's somewhere over the network. So as system A, how do we find, how do we discover system B to call it over our network? Another challenge we inherit is how do we configure now our distributed application? Right? As the monolith, all of its configuration lived in a single you know, massive properties.xml file. But the advantage of this was it gave all of our application a consistent view. Right? If we changed something into being maintenance mode, right? we want to do you know, database maintenance or a schema change. We would change the config file, and all of the subsystems, A, B, C, and D, would believe we're in maintenance mode simultaneously. Versus now, we have sort of a distributed configuration problem. We don't want A to believe we're in maintenance mode, while B does not believe we're in maintenance mode. Right? We might get inconsistent behavior at the application level. So how do we deal with the fact that now we have this distributed configuration and coordination problem? And the last major problem we're inheriting is a security problem. In the kind of traditional monolithic world, we had the three zones. But the challenge was you know, what we were doing with the three zones was basically segmenting our network. right? And when we talk about network segmentation, what we're doing is taking a single larger physical network and splitting it into sort of smaller chunks. 
right? So segment A and B as part of a larger physical network. And what this let us do is restrict the blast radius. So if there was a compromise in segment A, it wouldn't overflow into segment B. We could sort of control the traffic at a coarse grain between these different segments. And there was many different techniques for doing this. You know, virtual LANs or VLAN, firewall-based approaches, software-defined network-based approaches. But overall, what these gave us was a relatively coarse grain way of bucketing different aspects of our infrastructure together. And so each of these segments may have still had dozens or hundreds of discrete services as part of it. Now, the challenge as we start talking in a microservice architecture is where do we draw those dividing lines, right? We still have sort of the line on the left, which goes to our you know, demilitarized zone, and the line to our right that goes to maybe our data tier zone. But now our internal application zone has a much more complicated service-to-service -service flow. It's no longer one application that's kind of talking internally via function calls. It's many discrete services talking over in a network. So how do we start to draw lines in between it? Right? And with a simple example, we might look at these four services and say, well, you can still do the same thing. You can still cross sort of hatch and put, put firewalls in between all of these things. The problem is this is meant for illustrative purposes. This is a simple example, right? As we start talking about real infrastructure, it's not four services, right? It's hundreds. In the case of you know, some of our customers, it's thousands of applications with complicated you know, service to service communication flows where it's no longer obvious where these cut points are. It's not trivial to figure out where do I deploy firewalls and what should my network topology look like to constrain this traffic anymore. So how do we sort of think about this problem, right? In some sense, you know, what it starts with is saying, you know, what's ideal? What would be kind of the perfect scenario, right? The perfect scenario would be able to say, you know, we move away from a coarse grain model where we say there's hundreds of services as part of a virtual segment to saying there's actually only the services, the sort of fine grain sort of boundary only matches exactly two services, right? It's only the sort of sender and receiver. Right? And so that's what I've sort of indicated with the orange box is like, what if you could draw your network segment that finely, right? where you said A can talk to B, um, and then you maybe have another fine-grained segment that says you know, C and D can talk bidirectionally to each other. So in this arrangement, we bring down the segment to only those services that essentially need to communicate. But these things would be sort of impossible if you could, you know, it's not easy to cleanly separate them. It might be the case that a actually still needs to talk to C, and B still needs to talk to D. So how do we avoid basically then just creating a huge zone that says A, B, C, and D can talk to each other freely? Right? Instead, we want the ability to sort of overlap these definitions. So we might have an overlapping definition that says, well, A can also talk to C, even though we've already defined A can talk to B as well. But because A can talk to C and B should not imply that C and B can talk to each other. These shouldn't sort of you know, it shouldn't be associativity of, of sort of access. So what we'd like to do is maintain a fine grain uh, granularity of how these things actually communicate without resorting to creating, you know, the large segment, the large blast radius of just saying, you know, all of these services can communicate because it's too hard to find the dividing lines between them. So as we talk about the challenges of moving from, you know, monolithic architecture to microservice architecture, what we're doing is sort of talking about the trade-off between our developer efficiency and our operational challenge. Right? What we gained was now these pieces can all be developed independently, deployed independently, scaled independently, but we've inherited three operational challenges. Right? How do we have all of these pieces discover one another? How do we have, you know, solve our distributed configuration challenge now that we no longer have one configuration file? And how do we segment our network such that we don't have sort of an enormous blast radius? And so the way we think about it is these kind of three capabilities together are really to what a service mesh aims to solve, right? It's really as we go to a microservice or service-oriented pattern, what are the challenges and is there sort of a solution that thinks about them in a well-integrated way as opposed to kind of a patchwork of different technologies we have to bring together? And as we sort of look at how we've solved these pro this problem over the last few years, you know, for a large part, we've looked at the first two. So for some folks who are you know, maybe less familiar with console, what we've done in the past is really through two different mechanisms. One is console has this notion of the service registry, right? And the registry is sort of a central catalog of all of the nodes in your infrastructure, all the services running, the current health status. And the goal is that this registry captures everything that's running such that you can solve the discovery problem. 
right? As a service comes up, it can be programmatically inserted into the registry. And then when any of your downstreams need a route to it, they can basically query the registry online. So instead of using a static IP address that's maybe going to a load balancer, you can just talk to the registry and say, what are all of the downstream databases or what are all the downstream APIs? And this has historically been integrated using a DNS interface. So for most applications, there was no change to them. They just started querying for you know, database.service.console. And behind the scenes, that's being translated by console into a lookup of the database. So able to let us sort of mask the location of services and deal with IPs changing, and instead hard code a service name and not an IP address. The other challenge we've looked at for a long time was distributed configuration. And our view was, how do you put that into a central key value store and then expose that with a series of APIs, you know, an ability to block and receive changes in real time? So console's HTTP API allows you to trigger and notify any time a change is made. So now you can switch a flight that says, we're going into maintenance mode, and all of your services can get that in real time, as opposed to changing 50 configuration files and redeploying all of your services. So looking at how we solve the kind of distributed configuration problem. So the question then remains for us, how do we solve segmentation? This has sort of been an exercise left to reader. Uh, and so today, we're very, very excited to talk about a first-class solution for this problem that we're calling Console Connect. 